This time on The Restorers. French polisher Alex coordinates an epic collaboration of three restorers to save a classic 1930s rocking horse. Why the long pipe? Uh, maybe because you bought me a pile of sticks. <laughs> Sculptor Nick has to rescue a mid-century stone damsel in distress. Holy moly. It is in such a state. And upholsterer Craig wrestles with a gargantuan Victorian chair. Oh, right, something's happening. Oh, who said upholstery's easy? Decorative antiques dealer Drew Pritchard has racked up 30 years of experience in the trade. I've just won. <laughs> His restoration. But Drew's not alone. Hello. He's joined by a team of savvy dealers. <laughs> what do you think? <laughs> what have you bought? <laughs> along with an army of incredible expert restorers. It's perfect. It's a restorer's dream. With over a century of artisanship between them. This is my magic stuff. They have the skills. Every angle has to be perfect. And that gives us a nice, neat corner at the front there. Know-how. Got to try and put that feeling in there. Work it too cold, it'll just split. And secrets. Basically drying out tea bags and a bit of sand. To turn forgotten junk into sought-after treasure. Well, blimey, that looks a bit different, doesn't it? Amazing, isn't it? Wow! Relic Timber Antiques. Today, he's getting a new mission from dealer Rob Kane, himself from a family of restorers and known for his passion for rescuing pieces others have given up on. Back in the day, people were spending the time and they had the skills to make beautiful items. As soon as I saw this, I thought of Alex and I thought, great, he's the man. Together, we'll see the vision and we'll see it through. And this is what I love about my job. Dealers like Rob bring me the type of projects that you can never sort of guess what's coming. I just hope it's something you feel that passion for and the enthusiasm to get going. So, why the long pose? <laughs> Uh, um, maybe because you bought me a pile of sticks. I'm making it my life's work now, just to bring you the most incredibly unusual. When I first saw the horse, I was a little bit underwhelmed. I just thought this was in the worst state. To be honest, I probably wouldn't have bothered myself. However, Rob suspects that despite its appearance, this little horse might be a highly sought-after thoroughbred, which, fully restored, could be worth up to £3,000. There is a model, Sporty Boy. 1930s mm -hmm. and there's parts of this makes me think it's definitely from that ilk so is everything here then well i'm glad you got the head shall we flip this on Let's, i've got the rear end i think you have look at that um we've got his head here so now it's all in one piece i can actually see the shape of it and i can see it's actually a pretty mm. nice horse five pounds by rob in suffolk probably dates from the 1930s. With elegant lines and finely carved detail, it resembles pieces made by Lines Brothers, some of the most famous toy makers of the day. And Rob's decided it deserves a five-star restoration. Mm, the people are into these as a collector's item. They're going to come round and they're going to pick every single piece apart. They're yeah. going to look. But what we're going to do is we're going to give them more than what they think they're going to get. We're going to yeah. give them a better finish. Yeah. So we're going to go the full restoration, but it's got to be a classic one. It's got to be absolutely classic finish. We need to make it as lifelike as we can. Growing up like I have in my family background, we take things which are absolutely on the last legs and we restore them well. And this is a classic example where you're going to take a horse straight from the knacker's yard into, you know, this. Alex will have to find someone who can recreate authentic paintwork. We're going to go for that classic proper finish that lovely build on the paint the right color so it wants to look better than it did yeah i'm really excited that this isn't just a bog standard restoration rob has said he wants every detail of this perfect which for me is great because i can really get enthusiastic about it and try and create something which is what he's looking for do you feel like i've asked a lot of you am, am i nagging a bit <laughs> <laughs> you are nagging. It's in a state, but it does have potential. <laughs> Leave it with me then. It's time to start putting Rob's horse back together. And so I'm going to need just to mark this now with a pencil, drill those holes, get the dials in, 
and hopefully line it up perfect. That is a very good fit. Six more. I'm cutting a groove in my dowel, and that's because I want this to be a tight joint. The hole that I'm drilling for the dowel and the dowel are a very tight fit, very tight. If I don't put a, a groove down to let the air and the glue squeeze out, the dowel just won't even make its way into the hole and I'll have a really poor joint. But this horse bears the scars of a difficult life. Over time, obviously this thing has been neglected. I'm guessing it's been very wet. So you've had shrinkage and expand together. It's a bit tight. Hmm. Based in Llandidno, Nick Elphick has been rescuing dilapidated antique statues for over 20 years. Nick's real job is he's a figurative sculptor. He isn't a restorer. This is something he does for me on the side because I ask him and he's a friend and I know him. His real job is that. He's a classically trained sculptor. Oh. Rope. Hello, mate. Oh, hello, you, uh, <laughs> don't let go of the head. Yeah. Um, it's bad. It's oh. <sighs> Okay. Is, um, she is in distress. And then you can see real NAFO repairs on here. Yeah. Really bad. Sand and cement, oh. terrible. Um, yeah. You can see around the back here. But I'll have to use a, a thin grinder and just take it off very slowly. So hopefully the real her is under there somewhere. This statue is based on an 18th century French masterpiece called The Bather by Christophe Gabriel Allegrand. The original, carved from marble, is in the Louvre but this simple version was cast in stone during the 20th century and has gained character from a lifetime outdoors. Well, what you find with composition stone, the really cheap stuff is so smooth that it never really gains any patination. But with this type of composition stone, it picks up the dirt. I think she's lovely. I mean, the face is lovely. She's trying to resemble the earlier masterpieces for a more mass market, isn't it? Now, you can see there. Ah, oh, it's see, loose. Underneath it is an extremely pretty thing, mm. right? With a nice patination from the waist down. It's yeah. great. Yeah. The waist up, it's terrible. A lot like me. <laughs> uh, I sell patinated things all the time, whether it's a leather chair or a garden bench. I think it's more attractive by a country mile. It's that instant class, instant style, instant age. And all of these different things add up. It's just falling to bits. Ooh, oh, look at that. Yeah, so I'll rescue this damsel in distress. Yeah, in distress. <laughs> yeah. I'll bring, I'll bring it back to life. I'll find her in there. No problem. We'll Cheers, get it dropped over, right? Thank you, mate. Cheers. I think the first thing I'll do is get the head back on. I'm going to put a pin in here. It's a little bit frightening because it, you know, <laughs> when you're putting the holes in, it's, it's very fragile. This, this stone. And when the head's on, I can then look at the portions and what needs to be done. There we go. Holy moly. It is in such a state. So, obviously, this pin just wasn't long enough. I just could have put that in a lot further. I'm going to put another pin in, quite a long pin, to give it a lot more strength. Such soft stuff. Lovely lambstone for breakfast. Quick setting glue. It's for setting major slabs of stone uh, in the building industry, and it is solid. It's always better to put more than you need. I hope this head is in the right place. It should be, but if it's not, this is never coming off. No going back now. Absolutely no going back. Now all we have to do is wait. Okay, so it's uh, nice and set now. Oh, William. Yay! Stayed on. It's totally transformed it now, the head's back on. Her head, there's something so charming about her face. It's helped me understand what needs to happen with this figure. But Nick isn't the Fessor's cement watch job. 
So I've got to take off all this clay. So a nice crisscross across so I'll then slowly chip them off. So it's the wrong material, it all needs to come off. So it just means I know where I need to go. Oh, and obviously it's going to damage it somewhat. But I'll just try and do it the best I can. In Nick's studio, the ugly cement is now being carefully chipped away from Drew's early 20th century figurine. It's taken some time, but you can actually see the body underneath. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to re-sculpt in clay uh, the original sculpt back. Uh, I'm going to look at the classical masters that, that it's based on and rework this female figure in. I'm going to try and go quite quickly. I'm obviously really nervous. I haven't worked in this style before. Get this arm in. Get this wrist in. Shoulders are quite important. It's important to do the silhouette. Get the silhouette on there first. Shoulder in. So I'm just getting the basic proportions right. Just working out where the muscle structures go and just using my scraper tool, which uh, is great because it defines contours. So you can follow from where the stone is around. It's nice to see her start to form. This would have been carved with a chisel, which is basically a very different way of sculpting. Sculpting is adding clay uh, and carving is taking away. So what I've got to do with this is try and make it look like it's carved. The original carved statue by Allegrand was so highly regarded in its time that King Louis XV of France bought it to give to his mistress, Madame du Barry, to decorate the garden of her chateau. So I have now sculpted, I mean, it's the same proportions, but it just gave me um, more play. And um, I could actually bring the arm back slightly, like the original one, and bring this hand in. Once the clay model is finished, Nick will use it to make a mold from silicon and resin. The mold can then be filled with a material similar to the stone aggregate used by the 1920s sculptor. It's a long way to go, but before he can even begin, Nick will have to make the new clay body parts look like they've had decades of exposure to the elements. And I decided to go and buy an old brush, and last night I thought to myself, how can I represent this? But what I've come up with is actually putting a bit of plastic sheeting over and tapping ever so slightly. You know, it sort of brings, as I've got a little bit of uh, sandpaper, and then to soften it a bit, you go over this, with that, you know, and once this is cast in the same colour and material, it, you just won't know the difference. Start being a little bit creative with it. In the carpentry workshop, Rob Kane's 1930s rocking horse is almost reassembled, although Alex has had to resort to a mallet in order to get the stubborn pieces back together. That is going to be a super strong repair. All that glue squashing into all those cracks, that's gone really well. But the most difficult task is still ahead. To create the perfect finish Rob wants, Alex now has to make even the finest crack disappear. The next stage is to fill these gaps. These mahogany wedges, these are quite tough, but there'll be a little bit of give ever so slightly in this pine body. So as we knock it in, it'll wedge itself in. Once that glue set, it's never coming out. Beautiful. This is going to be a slow process. Only after around a dozen individually cut slivers of mahogany have been teased into every last nook and cranny will this horse be ready for painting. It's a key moment in the project and dealer Rob Kane has come to Shropshire to see if he can discover more about this horse's story and exactly what an authentic restoration should look like. We're coming to see Alison, who's a rocking horse specialist, and she's going to be able to guide us and help us with the colour and the paint. 
Alison. Rob, hello. Nice Hi. to meet you. Hi. Oh, thank you so much for taking the time, first of all, to, to meet me and invite me to your amazing place. Alison Smith has a collection of iconic toys, including famous classics from the same era as Rob's horse. And he's hoping she can confirm whether or not this is the sporty boy model that commands much higher prices. So if this is the exciting and nervous part, because I have got some photos. Uh, let's have a look. Which we can see sort of the structure of our horse as it is. Um, well, I think you're on to a winner. I think okay. this is definitely a sporty boy model. Brilliant. I can tell that by the shape of the horse, the way mm. it's been carved, um, the shortness of the ears. Typical of a lines production head, really. This is great. Honestly, I'm just, yeah. I'm so... One of the most successful toy makers in British history, supplying world-class retailers like Harrods. The Sporty Boy Rocking Horse was one of their most elite products. With only hundreds produced, they're now highly sought after by collectors. This is Lines Sporty Boy right. Rocking Horse. Brilliant. Uh, most features on this horse are original. It has been restored, but authentically. With these, because they're so just lifelike, were they made as a lifestyle horse? or? Yeah, or absolutely. The... the original idea of a rocking horse was specifically to give children practice to enable them to ride a real horse. With regards to the paintwork, was it a traditional hand-painted? Yes, if you do everything as close to original as you can and pull it all off, um, you could expect to get up to, I don't know, 2,000... ...original horse. You can imagine how pleased I am. This is just... It shows why it's so important that you take the extra time with everything you do. You take the extra time with the restoration, you come and meet the right people, you get the right information, the right valuation. You know, I've taken a bet and I've come away a winner. This has turned out to be no ordinary rocking horse. And the pressure's now on Alex and his team to carry out no ordinary restoration. In the sculptor's studio, the figurine based on an 18th century masterpiece has reached the final stages of an epic restoration. She's now tightly clamped in a silicon and resin mold, inside which her perfectly sculpted replacement body parts, now cast in stone, should be hardening into... Because I am really nervous about taking this off. There's a hell of a lot of work in there. And if the worst comes to the worst, we're going to have to smash the whole lot off and then recast it again, um, which I really don't want to have to do. Fingers crossed. I've done everything right. Oh, I've got butterflies. Okay, so it's ready to pull off. Here we go. Ooh. Okay, please. That looks okay from here. I'm not gonna know exactly until I've got the back off. Yeah, you know what? That's pretty good. And these big spots, no, I'm pretty chuffed. <laughs> Great. Put the mask on. All Nick needs to do now is clear away the traces of the casting process before adding the finishing touch, which is to use a mixture of oil paints to blend the new stone in with the original that stained green from decades exposed to the elements. In this statue, it was actually particularly difficult because there was nothing left, and I really had to try and find the sort of form I know Drew's got a particular eye, and, you know, I really hope he likes it. It was a real mess. I'm not sure what I'm expecting today, because the statue that I gave Nick wasn't really a statue anymore. It was just a part of broken rubble. Um, it was about as bad as it gets, to be perfectly honest with you. It was... Um... ...with a brutal repair in cement that had failed to hold. Hello, mate. Hello. How are you? Yeah, yeah. Oh, wow. I think. Well, she certainly didn't look like that before. <laughs> no. Is it the same statue? Yeah, yeah it's been it was, some work. It was smashed to bits. You've just bought another one, haven't you? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, perfect. <laughs> All Nick's artistry has been poured into this piece, clearing away the ugly cement to reveal the original stone and rebuilding it with not only the simplicity of the 20th century cast, but also the beauty of the inspirational original. Amazing. I mean, staggering, really, isn't it? Considering what he had to start off with, he's not starting with a, anything of any value or worth. 
New hand, new arms, new, new arms. hand. Yeah, new back, new yeah. chest. Uh, it was a bit of a labour of love, to be honest with you, especially getting that cast on there. It was quite scary. Sculpted it in the clay. Oh, wow. Remoulded it in a two part mould and pressed it back together. But getting that pressed on was difficult, and then I carved it back. That's great. Thank God. <laughs> Drew liked it. And do you know what was really good is the fact he couldn't remember what was wrong with it. Like, I was like, that just gave me a massive sense of pride. I was just, just chuffed because. That's what the ultimate goal is on doing a, rest a restoration, not knowing that it's ever been restored, you know, and it worked. That patination, you put that on, haven't you? It just yeah. looks great. There was a lot of techniques in there, and actually I've learned a lot on it as well, which I've really enjoyed. You know, I love the original 18th century piece, so... But, you know, this is a very far away away from that. I know. We know. But, but it was nice to look at it, and I brought her hair down as well, which was missing. I can't tell it was ever broken off the body. There's no way of knowing. And then the sculpting of the arms and the hands. You know, that's difficult. And if anything, the ones he's done were better than the ones that were on it anyway. But it's nice to bring it back. <laughs> it is bring nice it back, to bring isn't it back, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. And it was junk. I mean, it was ready for the bin, wasn't it? Nobody else was going to fix it. Exactly. Thank Cheers, you, mate. Bud. Thank you. Marvellous. Thank you. I think she's going to look fantastic in, in someone's garden. She'll bring a lovely bit of femininity, and, you know, it, just knowing it's going to go somewhere nice. And I know it will. Drew will be able to get it somewhere, you know, lovely. This fills me full of pride. Based in North Wales, for the past 30 years, Master Upholster Upholstering Job. Basically, over the years, Craig and I have got an understanding and he knows what I want. I don't have to tell him how I want things finished, he already knows. He does it perfect first time every time, and that's why I keep bringing it stuff to him. But today, Drew has a huge challenge for Craig. This is great. No, slow down, slow down. We'll break the frame. <laughs> <laughs> There we go. Marvellous. Right, let's get it up there. One, two. Ugh. Right, so what we have is a John Ward mahogany reclining convalescence chair yep. on magnificent phosphor bronze caster. Nice, isn't it? Yeah. It's when a... you think of the age of it, and it's still solid, that, isn't it? Yeah. The yeah. quality, the worst colour for it. Yeah. It has been reupholstered in the past, probably 1960s, looking at that yeah. fabric. I've done it at night, as well, not yeah. yeah. it? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah, no. This sort of chair is a little challenged, OK? It's not the prettiest thing there, is it, really? Let's be honest with you. But the reason I love this chair, and I want to save it, is that this is a piece of 19th century industrial furniture. It was made for a purpose. They didn't survive in great numbers, and that is without doubt the most original one I've ever found. An exceptional example that just needs Craig's touch. With its reclining back, sturdy wheels and pull-out footstool to convert into a daybed, this 19th century recumbent chair was designed by John Ward, a London-based maker of so-called invalid carriages, whose many patents for a similar example is held in the Science Museum collection. Drew's brought this chair into me because we see eye to eye. We can see the potential in some things. We can see that this chair is a little bit quirky. It needs to be something classy. I tell you what, that's not bad, is it? It's in that that shape. is pretty oh, good. All this hessian, you see, that normally perishes and rots away, so that's in really good nick. Wow. So. And even this doesn't stink, does it? It's not bad at all. Why don't you sniff it, not me? Yeah, I know, it's a habit. This chair, what I need to do with it is really reimagine the sort of person that's going to buy it. I don't think they're going to buy it to convalesce in, they're going to buy it to really sit in it occasionally, but it's more for looking at. So just wipe the ugly off it, basically. We want rid of all of this yeah. disgusting cover. If I get rid of all that, yeah. clean the woodwork, take the back off it, find broken springs, find mechanism broken. You know, if there's a split frame that can't be seen till the fabric's off, then that's got to be repaired. So there's any number of things that could turn out to make this a big job. So, I've got the footrest off it, both arms off it. Look, I've not even looked behind it yet. Oh, wow. Look at that. Look at the size of them springs. So they're what's... Yeah. Right, so that's why this back goes... pushes back on its own. It's these massive springs here. What I might do is I'll take them screws out of there and see if the back comes off now. I'm just a bit concerned that it's going to fly off and 
half a century. I can hear it creaking. Why is it creaking? Right, so the screw's out. That back's got nothing holding it on. So what's going on? I'll just try and lift this a little bit and just see. Ooh. Right, I can see what's going on here now. This spring, it's got a big long arm on it that's going all the way up here, goes through a piece of wood here. So it's obviously this that's holding the back in place. I wonder if I can move it. Oh, there we go. Slowly, slowly, I think. Oh, right, something's happening. Oh, this is all right, getting this off. I've got to get the thing back on again when I've done it. <sighs> Rob Kane's 1930s rocking horse, freshly revealed to be a rare and authentic sporty boy model, has arrived in the Derbyshire studio of Jill Jessup, who's been restoring paintwork for the past 30 years. Jill has sealed Alex's perfectly restored woodwork with a coat of traditional gesso, made by mixing powdered chalk and rabbit skin glue, which has then been sanded for a polished finish. When the rocking horse arrived from Alex, he'd restored the woodwork. He'd glued it all together and, and made it all sound and, and the right shape. But wood has a lot of imperfections. There are splinters and holes and bits with applied gesso. It just gives you that lovely smoothness that you can't get out of wood. Now, I always use pigments that were available to people in the Victorian and Edwardian era, the yellow ochres, the earth colours, the umbers, because that gives the look that they were creating. So they're the right things to use. You, you mix things by eye, and because it's not done on a paint mixing machine, there are slight variations in the paint where I've not mixed it properly, and these variations are good. On something that's supposed to be an animal, even more so. Nice even coats, what we need. I grew up with horses that were a passion when I was young. And I'm quite particular about colours and, and patterns on horses. I want them to be real. Takes me back to grooming. That's <laughs> yeah, nice. Sporty boys were dappled, a traditional finish for English rocking horses and a trend thought to have begun in 1851, when Queen Victoria herself bought a rocking horse in Dapple Grey. Right, let's see if we can make some marks that look like dapples. Should be a bit more there. We don't want anything too dramatic. I think if they look really dramatic, it takes away from the horse a bit. If I stand back and go, yes, that's all right, I'm happy. Well, I like, but that's what Rob does. Yeah, that's good. Let's paint him some pretty socks. Just soften off the edges. I've got quite a fair set of choppers on this one. <laughs> Rocking horses always have mad eyelashes. There you are, sort of proper fakey. Right, ears and nose. Right, I wonder if I can sort of recline it a little bit. Oh, oh. oh there we go. Right, so that's, a, that's the back off. Oh, I'm too old for this. In the upholsterer's workshop, Craig has finally wrestled Drew's 19th century convalescent chair into its components, only to discover the worst. Broken webs. Broken web. Yeah, they're all gone. The webs have perished completely. Traditionally made from flax or cotton herringbone, English webbing provides essential support to the entire upholstery. The 100-year-old seat base and back will have to be removed and replaced from scratch. Once you've stretched it, you can actually hear it pinging, it's that tight. 
built. For the cover, Craig's chosen a grey herringbone wool to create a traditional but modern effect. And these lumps here are actually what they call tack drags. And it's where, literally, the tacks are dragging and it creates lumps and bumps. So the correct way to do this, so you don't get tack drags, the whole of your hand, and from there to there, hold the fabric. So starting in the middle, pulling the fabric up, get it nice and tight. Then you can tack, tack, tack. And that'll give you a nice smooth finish. Right, so I've finished all the upholstery on the back. I need upholstery in here. I can't do that until the back's fitted. Okay, so what I'm trying to do now is get that spring up through into that hole. Who said upholstery is easy? <sighs> Rob Kane's authentic sporty boy has left the paint studio and is now in the Anglesey workshop of leather refurbisher Martin Ashworth, who began learning his trade 30 years ago whilst making saddles for real horses. If, if I could sneak a ride on them, then I was... Uh... I, I considered myself well in, but being able to actually work on one seven, you know, nearly 60 years later is it's quite a privilege, really. This is a strap cutter, which allows me literally just to rip straps out the hide. And you set the graduations here, and then you run the leather up against the shoulder, and you will cut out a uniform strap straight out the hide. There you go. Martin uses an aged bridle leather to replicate the accessories that would have been included with the original Sporty Boy. I have seen some photographs of it before it has been restored. And it's been a feat, and I've seen hundreds of rocking horses in my time. And I've seen them in all sorts of states. But it, the bridle and saddle equipment back on it and bring it back into life again. Um, so some child in the future um, can get the use that the children did a hundred years ago. There it is. In the upholstery workshop, Drew's convalescence chair is well and truly on the mend. For the woodwork, Craig's using a French polish to remove the worst of the scratches without hiding the grain and patina. What we had to do with this chair was take it from something that you would be ill in to something that you want to sit and drink wine in. Uh, and that's not the easiest thing you're going to do, but that's generally what we're going for, you know. Yeah, when Drew brought this chair in, I thought, what's he doing here? Why, why has he bought a chair like this? When it arrived a week ago, this once high-end chair was disfigured by the tattered remnants of an unappealing 1960s upholstery job. Hello, mate. Hi. So this is it, done? Yeah, this is it, finished. Yeah, not bad, isn't it? Yes. Liking the colour. To the untrained eye, the appeal of this chair was hard to see, but with crisp, understated tweed coverings and newly gleaming mahogany, its sturdy lines and quirky character have emerged. No, it's very, very nice. It's all about the engineering with that, because it's a big brute of a chair, oh, I... and now, hopefully, that grey's lightened it up a bit, yeah. and it looks quality. The frame's good. All the hardware on it's really nice. The fabric we've used, great how he's finished it, just how I want it doing, that's great. Going all the way across the chair, and I think, yeah, I can sell that. I should really try it for size, shouldn't I? would I? have thought at your age you need to be just testing. <laughs> <laughs> right, then. Oh. I'll recline you. Yeah, it is. It's a, a recumbent armchair, this fella. A recumbent? Fella. Yeah. That's not a word you don't hear very often, is it? No. Recumbent. Is that enough? Yeah, it's nice, that. Want the foot rest out? Please, yeah. It is very comfortable. It's just the mark of a good chair. That's a TV chair now. Oh, it is, isn't it? We'll put yeah. a gin and tonic and throw it Bag of chips. Bag of chips. Yeah. <laughs> cool. This chair is Drew all over. It's the sort of thing that he does. He'll get something cumbersome, have it upholstered in a way that it'll fit into a modern environment, and it works really well every time. And 
I like the pounds. This chair will now be marketed at around two thousand pounds. No, it's a lovely job. It'll sell itself down to the engineering, the quality of the tweed on it, the reupholstery, you know. But I, the the shop for to sell it is this all out. Yeah, yeah. That's yeah. the shop. That's yeah. what's going to sell it. I think you know you can see this in, a, in like a gents' tailors or something, can't you? Yeah. I do love the process of finding something that is literally on its last legs. You know, this is the last chance saloon for this chair. And we've saved it. And now it's worth something. It will go on to a loving new home. In North Wales, Alex is putting the finishing touches to the base of the classic 1930s rocking horse. And it's time to find out if the final product of what's been an epic restaurant dealer, Rob Kane. There's a lot of passion with a job like this in terms of if it doesn't go right, then it's on my shoulders. There's been a lot of money spent. And especially since he's learnt it's a sporty boy, he's super precious about this thing. It has to be what he had in mind. And there's that restorer inside me that's like, right, well, it can't just be a rocking horse now because, you know, that's just not the way I'm brought up. It's just not the way I'm programmed. I'm programmed to, well, this is it then. We have to restore this to, to the actual top spec. And that's when the game changed because you're like, right, we all need to up our game now. I'm just really worried now that they've bitten off more than they can chew. Three weeks ago, this horse arrived in Alex's workshop, literally headless, with a cracked and damaged structure, and without even a hint of its once lab. Alex. Rob, good to see you again. How are you, Rob? Nervous to see you today. <laughs> Full of anticipation. Yeah, this is a serious one. OK, go slowly. You ready? Yep. Have to be careful of the lovely mane. Yeah. Oh, wow. Yeah. Oh, my word. It's amazing, yeah. isn't it? Yeah, that is just... I almost started to laugh because I was thinking if you just got and bought <laughs> an original <laughs> antique horse. <laughs> That's insane. This pristine rocking horse is barely recognisable. The delicate lines of the original design have emerged and every magical detail has been taken care of. Down to the last eyelash. The sheet comes off, and I am just served and worked on. Everything's right. I mean, it is a, a Victorian piece of yeah. iconic, and it's a statement piece. The leather work that Martin's done is just exceptional, and the paintwork from Jill, it's unbelievable. Yeah, the dappling is just mm. spot on. I mean, I've been and seen this dealer, Alison. Mm -hmm. She was so into the dappling. I mean, a lot of them are dapple grey, but mm. just the dapple was so important. Yeah. Um, and she actually had this, this same mane and the same length. Having seen a sporty boy horse and seeing that finish, ours now has that real, original, authentic look. It looks like a heritage piece. It's not been a cheap restoration, mm. but... What are you thinking it's going to be retailing out with you? Refurb the three grand. Wow. For me as a dealer, I mean, it's great because I'm going to get that back. To relief, he loves it as much as I do. I mean, who can't love it? The thing is an absolute work of art. Yeah, look at that. Brilliant. The it's movement gorgeous, is great, isn't it? isn't it? And not a squeak. No. no it runs lovely. It's a special piece of furniture, and I think, yeah. You were good to push through with this one. Yeah, it's saved, isn't it? Mm. I mean, it's just been a great journey because we've come to this and we've recreated this amazing horse, historical, and the finish is high, so, yeah, I'm on a high, and everybody who's worked on this should be on a massive high. I've got to say, it was a big responsibility being put in charge of putting this back together, but it's been a privilege. But honestly, Alex, this is, this is really, really good. You're lucky to own it. <laughs>